Hi everyone, thank you for being here for 11th class, which kind of feels a little bit strange because this means that we're almost at the end of our course. And uh, just so you know, um, as we start today, I wanted to uh, say that next week, our class next week will be our last theory-oriented one, uh, because that's mostly because I wanted to reserve our last session for a more general kind of discussion on uh, the topics of this course and to kind of get your impressions and your feedback and uh, whatever else. It's mostly a space, this last class will be mostly a space for us to talk about um, whatever we think um, is necessary, whatever you want to, to bring up um, in our course. Now, having said that, um, for the topic of today, um, in this class we'll talk about, and I, I know I always say this, um, but it is a subject that I, I really love and I, I find incredibly interesting. And it's actually something that I've been concerning myself with for, um, for a couple of years, for maybe a little bit more than that, um, but for a few years already. Um, so I've titled this class, Witches and Goddesses, Herbalists and Healers, Plants, Environment and the Reproduction of Resistance. Now, um, I wanted to make also, um, I think, a couple or to, to, um, yeah, to tell you a couple of things before we start um, with the subject itself, too. Um, first of all, I wanted to apologize for having had to finish class um, a little bit abruptly uh, last week. As I was kind of starting to steer our conversation towards the end last week, I received um, news that someone that I loved and admired very much had passed away from COVID. I don't think I've been able to fully process this yet, um, but um, I wanted to say that today that the loss of life happening in Brazil right now uh, is absolutely part of the ongoing genocidal and necropolitical project of the Bolsonaro regime in Brazil, um, something that is in particular affecting indigenous peoples. And um, I think it is uh, a very tangible manifestation of all the discussions that we've been having in this class. Um, I hope you, you understand. Now, um, moving on, I, I also know, so um, that during this semester we have discussed um, many difficult topics, right? And today will be one of those classes where this happens. Uh, we'll talk about the complex connections between things like abortion, um, contraception, infanticide sometimes, and enslavement. And there will be mention of uh, racialized violence and sexual violence. This, um, I wanted to say just um, for a content notice and uh, for you to know it's fine. Like This is a video so you can, of course, take some time if you need um, to um, process some of the, th the things that we will discuss today. Um, I also wanted, before we begin, to bring up a conversation about some terms used in, um, in uh, one of the texts of this week. Uh, the one from Londa Schiebinger. I find um, the book uh, that this text comes from very interesting, but I find the topic incredibly interesting. 
but I do have some problems, as I said. I do find um, the way that she writes quite problematic in some ways. And um, I wanted to clarify right now some of these issues. Uh, Schibinger, if you remember, is a historian of science. We have uh, engaged, we have read one of her texts earlier this semester for our class on science and the construction of race. Um, well, I do understand that Schiebinger, being a historian, she is drawing from uh, historical texts, from historical sources, but I don't think that her honestly quite extensive use of variations of the N-word in her text, um, even in the context of referring to those historical sources, is quite appropriate. Um, her being a white scholar, I think Schiebinger should have been far, far more mindful or more careful um, with how many times and how she throws around that word in, in uh, her text. And um, most seriously, while rereading this text um, for today, this is a book that I read uh, quite a while ago, but while rereading this text, I noticed that there are some instances where she uses this word in what seemed to be her own phrase constructions instead of using the word in a full quote that she um, took directly from a source. And uh, I wanted to bring this up because I think this is a kind of discussion that is fundamental for us to act, of course, with academic integrity. And uh, since I read this book a few years ago, as I mentioned, um, I, I believe, um, I mean, uh, even, even like since I, I read this book, her, her use of this word has, or her use of this and other terms too, had been bothering me quite a bit. But at the time, I don't think I had the tools to fully articulate uh, all of these issues particularly because I didn't have um, a lot of access to this kind of discussion in my very, very white institution. Um, and also, I don't believe that raising such a point with my peers um, at the time and within that context, within that institution, would have been productive or even, to be honest, possible at all. So... Even thinking about that, I didn't want this to be, go unaddressed for you too, to kind of pass this text to you and, and not uh, talk about this issue. So I wanted to bring this up. Um, another question is that I also don't appreciate her use of the term slave. If you notice, uh, throughout all of our classes um, this semester, I've been deliberately using the term enslaved instead. Um, I do this in my practice, in my research, in my writing, um, as a way to stress the fact that these were people upon whom the condition of enslavement was imposed. The question is that I believe, and this is of course um, not something that I came up with myself, but this is a um, part of a wider discussion, and my use of the term is, of course, influenced by um, many, by the work of many, many um, scholars, but I believe um, and I agree with um, other scholars that the term slave is problematic in the sense that it conflates one's existence with the violence that has been imposed upon them. Um, enslaved instead, uh, I believe, brings out the fact that this is a violence that was inflicted upon them by someone else, by the enslaver. And because of this, I, I believe this is a more appropriate term to shift the perspective of uh, the ongoing historical violence of slavery and to maintain the origin and the, perp the perpetrators of this violence 
which is white supremacists, the system of white supremacists, uh, white supremacy, and its um, its enactors, its accomplices, uh, to maintain all of this violence in its origins and its perpetrators visible and liable. Um, which to me uh, is a fundamental aspect also of decolonizing practices, right? I think it's very, very important for us to be mindful um, not only of the structures that we're analyzing, but also of the language that we use to discuss certain things. Um, another question is that I have in relation to Schiebinger's text is her use of the term Amerindian. Um, Although, as far as I know, and here I'm being very mindful of the fact that I'm not a native, native English speaker, uh, but that I have, of course, researched uh, questions, these questions, um, this term does not carry quite the same weight um, of the N-word, but it is, without doubt, um, an outdated and problematic term for referring to the original peoples of the Americas. In Portuguese, um, in this case, we would typically use the term povos originarios, which is original peoples, or indigenous, which is indigenous. In Spanish, the equivalent term to Indian uh, which I will refrain from mentioning here, um, is a derogatory term. Um, the US-based Native American Journalists Association, NAJA, says that, and this is, I'm going to quote directly from, um, from their source, in relation to the terms American Indian or Native American, says, Either term is generally acceptable and can be used interchangeably, although individuals may have a preference. Native American gained traction in the 60s for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Over time, Native American has been expanded to include all Native people of the continental United States and some in Alaska. Native American and American Indian can be used interchangeably. However, the term is used only to describe groups of Native Americans, two or more individuals of different tribal affiliation. Journalists should always identify people by their preferred tribal affiliation when reporting on individuals or individual tribes. Um, for, of course, this is a, a quite an extensive discussion and it is one of those questions where there isn't really a, a consensus of course um, but for a very interesting and deeper discussion on this um, if you're interested in um, thinking about these terminologies questioning these terminologies I would encourage you to refer to a paper by Michael Yellowbird published in 1999 titled what we want to be called, Indigenous People's Perspectives on Racial and Ethnic Identity Labels. Um, I'm going to put that on our Google Drive for um, this week and this week's folder. Um, now, having said all of that and having made this, I believe, very, very important preamble, on language and also on how decolonizing practices also pass through that, how a reflection on the terms and the terminologies that we use to um, to talk about and analyze all these questions that we are uh, engaging with throughout this semester is important. Having said all of that, so I think now we can finally go on and start uh, with the discussion itself for this week. So, um, for the past few years, as I think I'm, I'm, I've probably mentioned before, um, I've been very, very interested in the study of plants associated with the management of fertility. And by that, by the management of fertility, I mean both in the sense of promoting it and in the sense of inhibiting it. 
I'm especially interested, of course, in plants used in the context of Latin America, though I have engaged with uh, some European plants too. Um, some of the plants that I've been uh, working with in the past years are things like penny royal, cinnamon, parsley, coconut, plantain. Um, I mean, there's so many. Um, one that I find particularly interesting is, for instance, Queen Anne's Lace. This is actually um, a plant that grows pretty much everywhere, um, which is a type of wild carrot that is used as a contraceptive in uh, regions as different as um, Appalachia in the southern United States or India and China. And it is a plant that also, since it is a type of wild carrot, it also grows wild, including around Berlin. Um, now that July is coming, we're going to start seeing a lot of Queen Anne's lace flowers sprouting all over the city. But today, specifically, we're going to talk about the plant that I think actually got, well, I think for sure, actually kind of got me into this whole research, into um, this whole research about um, plants related to, to fertility and to birth control and so on. The name of this plant is Cesalpinia pulcherimum. Uh, it is colloquially, this is of course the scientific Linnaean classification to go back to our whole perhaps um, discussion on Linnaeus and um, scientific classification, right? Um, but um, colloquially this plant is known as the peacock flower or poinciana or red flower of paradise or red bird of paradise. This plant is a national plant of Barbados, actually, and it is a species from the, from the Fabaceae family. Um, and please forgive me for my pronunciation of Latin names while attempting to make the word understandable in an English accent. This is very strange for me. But anyway, um, this is a plant of the Fabaceae family, um, which is the same family of peas, chickpeas, or alfalfa. Um, it is a plant that is assumed to be a native of the tropical areas of the uh, tropical and subtropical areas of the Americans of the Americas, um, though its origins cannot really be pinpointed exactly. Regardless, um, this is a plant that grows abundantly throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, even, as I said, earning the title of the National Flower of Barbados. The plant is uh, actually well known for its beauty. Um, its flowers typically display a gradient of very, very vibrant yellows and reds, and the rims of each petal are shaped in these elaborate little curls and curves. Each flower has also unusually long styles, which are um, those kind of, um, or pistils maybe, uh, I think it's the word. Um, usually they're bright red and topped um, with uh, red and yellow, or uh, red or yellow stigmas, which are little, little dots at the point of, of those structures. I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but I can also uh, show you a picture of the plant if you want. The flowers grow in very, very colorful clusters. Um, the, the leaves of this plant, um, which are shaped, um, I mean, the technical name for this type of leaves is bipinnate leaves by pinnet compound leaves. Um, they bear several thin pinnae, which are like small, um, um, like smaller or thinner kind of little branches where these like small oval shaped uh, leaflets grow. This morphology of the plant, I think, only adds to its beauty because from afar, the, 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 the flowering shrub, it is a shrub, 
by the way, looks almost like an impressionist painting, really, with these clusters of tender greens and vibrant reds and yellows spread all over. Fittingly, the name of this plant in Portuguese is Flamboyanzinho, uh, a name that I think hints also to the morphological similarity of this plant to the closely related, but not the same, flamboyant, de la, which, uh, whose um, Linnaean, or whose uh, scientific name is Delonyx regia. And it also, I think, hints to this extravagant, rather extravagant uh, look of the plant. Now, the beauty of this plant, the beauty of the peacock flower, was not lost on the European colonizers that invaded the Americas. Like many other flora, this shrub made its way across the Atlantic in ships that carried goods extracted, pillaged, and otherwise stolen from the continent. By 1700, this plant was grown as a decorative plant in many of Europe's most sophisticated botanical gardens. For the past years, indeed, I've been accompanying the growth of a peacock flower tree here, or shrub, shrub um, here in the Botanical Garden of Berlin, too. An appreciation of, uh, for this plant um, has not waned over time, as we can see, by its very presence in the Botanical Garden of this city. In Brazil, too, as in many other of the plant's native regions, the peacock flower is still widely used for urban afforestation due to its easy maintenance and, and really great beauty. This plant grows uh, in urban and rural landscapes in the Caribbean and more tropical areas of South America. Now, Aside from being a beautiful plant, however, extracts of its various parts were used as birth control method during the colonial period in the Americas um, by enslaved indigenous and African peoples. In greater doses, these extracts could also provoke abortions. It's not really possible to point out when and where exactly knowledge of the plant's properties originated. Just as it is, as it is difficult to pinpoint exactly the plant's origins. Um, from crops to wild flora and fauna to humans, um, the early colonial period was characterized by an intense exchange of biological matter amongst continents, or let's say in, in rougher terms, by the eagerness or the eagerness of Europeans to extract wealth from the colonies also extended to the exploitation and commercialization of plants and animals. Now the peacock flower is generally thought to have as I said, originated somewhere in the tropical and subtropical areas of the Americas. Knowledge about its abortive fashion and contraceptive properties is therefore um, frequently attributed to the native peoples of these areas. Some, however, believe that the peacock flower might have come from Africa in one of the many ships that additionally to carrying kidnapped and enslaved peoples to the Americas also carried numerous, numerous botanical specimens. Now, regardless of um, its origin, Schiebinger emphasizes that very few Europeans seem to have been aware of the peacock flower's fertility-inhibiting fertility properties. During the colonial period in the Americas, knowledge about the abortive fashion and contraceptive uses of the plant was transmitted orally within indigenous and African communities. And as a result of this, very few written accounts have survived. 
Amongst these rare accounts um, are those of German-born naturalist and artist Maria Sibylla Marian, one of the very few, very rare European women to travel alone in the 17th and 18th century in a scientific expedition. And also um, another account is that of Sir Hans Sloan, an English physician who would eventually become president of the Royal Society of London. These two naturalists, um, as um, these kind of scientists um, slash artists, I mean, were known at the time, um, Schiebinger observes um, these two naturalists um, documented the plant from very, very contrasting perspectives, starkly contrasting perspectives. Sloan seems to have come to know about the plant through his post as a physician in the um, West Indies. He placed, um, and this is a quote um, from Schiebinger, Sloan placed his discussion of abortive qualities of uh, of this flower uh, in the context not only of the colonial sufferings, but um, in uh, in the context of the growing conflict between doctors and women seeking assistance in abortion. Sloan's account offers no insight into the colonial politics surrounding the use of this plant. And rather, Schiebener argues, um, it seems to outline a growing rift between physicians and women who sought abortions. Sloan understood abortion indeed to be a complicated and dangerous procedure, mentioning how dissembling, quote, women would often seek unsuspecting physicians for assistance in procuring abortifacient medicines, recklessly endangering their own lives in the process. Abortion was perceived by European physicians as pertaining to the lowly realm of midwifery, right? And although doctors did have knowledge of abortifacients and contraceptives, seldom did they employ these in their practices. And concurrently, also, contraception has long been considered an immoral practice. Now, in contrast to Sloan's account, um, Marian's knowledge of this plant, which she called Flos Pavonis, came mostly with or from direct interviews with those who use this plant. It is perhaps due to this rather direct contact that Marian, according to Schiebinger, immediately positioned abortion within the context of colonial struggles and identified even infanticide as a form of resistance. In her book, Metamorphosis Insectorum Surinamensium, Marian states, and this is a quote, the Indians who are not treated well by their Dutch masters use the seeds of this plant to abort their children so that their children will not become slaves like, he, like they are. The black slaves from Guinea and Angola have demanded to be well treated, threatening to refuse to have children. In fact, they sometimes take their lives because they are treated so badly and because they believe that they will be born again, free and living in their own land. They told me this themselves. Now, by all these accounts and looking through um, these historical documents, these historical accounts, the peacock flower seems to have been a pretty significant actor then within the colonial context of the Americas. However, in spite of its importance in, in the colonies and regardless of its documentation and as um, an abortive fashion by Marian Sloan, and other European voyagers, uh, voyagers, colonizers, um, during the plant's journey to Europe, 
knowledge about its uses seems to have been lost. Within the confines of this continent here, the Flos Pavonis came to be grown exclusively for decorative or scientific purposes. Schiebinger argues then that this ignorance is not actually coincidental. At the time of the plant's crossing, the control of fertility, and this is a quote from her, worked directly against the interests of mercantilist states. Um, and uh, she also says that these culturally induced ignorances um, must be understood not only as gaps or absences of knowledge, but rather as an outcome of cultural and political struggle. In fact, at the time of the peacock, uh, the peacock flower's arrival in Europe, the Dutch Republic, as well as the English and French monarchies, were aiming to increase their populations, not decrease them. Increasing population was thought to be fundamental for the accumulation of wealth, of national wealth, as it would serve to and this is also a quote from Schiebinger, increase the production of crops and goods, fill the ranks of standing armies, and pay substantial taxes and rents. As such, it was not in the interest of public population policies of the time to propagate knowledge about abortifacient and contraceptive medicines. Now, and this, I guess, you might have already realized as I was um, giving you these quotes and, uh, and talking about this, this, of course, draws us back to our previous discussions on biopolitics. Let's remember that Foucault identifies sovereign power um, as the form of power being exercised at the time. Um, he identifies sovereign power as being enacted through what he calls deduction, right? The right to seize assets, goods, products, service, labor, and ultimately blood. He says, and I'm going again for this quote, um, that the sovereign exercised his right of life only by exercising his right to kill or by refraining from killing. He evidenced his power over life only through the death he was capable of requiring. The right which was formulated as the power of life and death was in reality the right to take life or let live. Now again, so this particular formation of power that Foucault was talking about here then boiled down, as we said, to deduction, right? To a right of taking away, a right of seizure that encompassed things, times, bodies, and as we, um, as we saw, ultimately life itself. Here, however, I would argue that if we analyze this particular condition, this particular context of the erasure of this knowledge with the, the, um, with the arrival of the plant in Europe, if we analyze this from a Foucauldian lens, this could potentially mean that what was, what was being seized here was knowledge. But not only knowledge, actually, but a, a very particular kind of knowledge, right? Knowledge about the management of fertility. Knowledge about the relationship between the gendered, racialized body and the environment, a cultural practices that was being actively erased and suppressed. But the question here is that I don't think that Foucault's understanding of sovereign power allows us to fully grasp the context and the conditions that surrounded the use of the peacock flower as a medicinal abortifacient. Well, I think this formulation can be useful to understand perhaps how the suppression of knowledge on abortifacients and contraceptives was enacted within the, the cultural and geopolitical context of Europe 
in association, for instance, with the witch hunts discussed by Sylvia Federici in her book Caliban and the Witch, which we already mentioned in this class. Um, when we talk about knowledge that emerges within the context of the occupied and colonized Americas, I think this discussion gains far more complex contours. This becomes, I think, per perhaps um, a little bit more clear if we go and look into how some European naturalists and physicians expressed concerns about how Native American medicines might affect white bodies, which were thought to be constituted in a way that was fundamentally different radically different from those of indigenous and African peoples, a subject and a matter that we already visited um, also earlier this semester. For instance, um, discussing new abortifacients brought from the Americas to Europe, Alexander von Humboldt um, remarks that, and this is a quote, the robust constitution of the savage in whom the different systems are more independent of each other resists better and for a longer time an excess of stimulants and the use of deleterious agents than the feeble constitution of civilized men. In tune with von Humboldt, Sloan wrote that enslaved women, after having given birth, quickly went back to work with their children tied to their backs. An image that, of course, evokes once again the idea of fragility associated with white womanhood, right? In contrast with the, perspe with the perception of black and indigenous and other people of color, and particularly black women, um, as able to bear an endless number of children. And uh, as also discussed previously, um, Maria Lugones outlines the existence, let's go back to that also, of the colonial modern gender system, right? That a system that enacts the serfdom violation and dehumanization of queer and colonized subjects. Lugones describes sexual dimorphism, an idea closely related to what writer and biologist Julio Serrano calls oppositional sexism, as one of the processes within this system. Um, this is described as the construction of two distinct and opposite genders with no space for ambiguity similarity or ambiguity or similarities or entanglements or intersections amongst them. Um, and this, um, this construction is also accompanied by the assumption of a natural and instinctive attraction between them. Ultimately, the colonial project, as again we have um, talked about, located the white male heterosexual subject as the civil subject, the embodiment of humanity and culture. And this uh, hierarchization it followed placed others in positions of subjugation as lesser humans. White women had, of course, historically occupied subaltern positions in relation to white men. They were, by virtue of their gender, perceived to exist in a state closer to nature, characterized as fragile and sexually passive. As such, they provided a sharp contrast to white men. The foundation of what uh, Lugones describes as this sexually dimorphic European gender system. Now, this system was, of course, as we have seen, um, further complicated by the specific articulations of gender that emerged in the colonies, which positioned the bodies of colonized women as the most disposable assets of the colonial sexual economy. 
these bodies, these uh, subjects and their bodies, were not merely classified as existing in a state closer to nature as white women were. Rather, they were perceived to inhabit that uh, an entirely different realm of known personhood, which effectively constructed them, um, as I said, as the most disposable assets of this uh, colonial sexual economy. And uh, the, this perception of, of, um, of the bodies of black and indigenous and other people of color, and particularly um, the, those uh, racialized as, uh, sorry, those gendered um, also as women within uh, this um, gender system. There is this perception of these racialized and gendered bodies, uh, these racialized and gendered subjects, um, to, I think that's a better term than reducing also a subject to a body, right? Um, but this perception um, of uh, these subjects as more, more resilient, more able to withstand any kind of hard labor and adverse conditions was really one of the funda foundational tenets for the justification of slavery and colonialism. Brazilian feminist writer Jessica Hipólito um, points out that in colonial Brazil, indeed, African women were subjected to numerous forms of sexual abuse. Within the, uh, these extreme circumstances, she identifies abortive practices as actual acts of resistance. Um, and this is a quote from her, measures of resistance to the slavery system where the black woman, though restricted, made of the few gaps left a shield of protection for herself and others. Similarly, Angela Davis writes that black women have been aborting themselves since the earliest days of slavery. Many slave women refused to bring children into a world of interminable forced labor, where chains and floggings and sexual abuse for women were everyday conditions of life. Now, Hippolyto and Davis's writings focus specifically on the conditions to which enslaved African women were subjected. Marianne's account of her voyage to Suriname supplements these, I guess, describing how slave women killed, and this is a quote, slave women killed the children in their wombs for the same reasons that many of them hanged themselves on trees or ingested deadly poisons to find release from the insufferable cruelty of New World slave masters. Von Humboldt's observations are, in contrast, particularly telling then. Um, the perception, as I said, of black and indigenous and other people of color as more resilient to suffering informs how medical and pharmacological research is carried out to this day. It is in former colonies like Chile, Guatemala, Thailand, India, or Nigeria, or Brazil too, that many medications and medical procedures are tested before they are offered to the populations of uh, colonial and imperialist powers. It is in the bodies of Puerto Rican people that the birth control pill was tested only to be later commercialized to its true target audience, the middle class, U.S., American, or European, or let's say as a broader term, northern public. And here I believe I think it's um, important for us to look back once again, um, and forgive me if I keep bringing things back, but I think it's also important to kind of start especially now um, that we're moving towards the end, to start tying many of those threads together. But this brings us back to our discussions on biopower, right? Remember that for Akile Mbembe, who built upon Agamben's discussion of bare life to advance the conversation on biopower with his 
theorization of, of um, necropolitics, the colony is the state of exception. Mbembe remarks, and this is a quote that I'm going to read to you once again, if the relations between life and death, the politics of cruelty and the symbolics of profanity are blurred in the plantation system, it is notably in the colony and under the apartheid regime that comes into being a particular terror formation. The most original feature of this terror formation is its concatenation of biopower, the state of exception and the state of siege. Crucial to this concatenation is once again race. In fact, in most instances, the selection of races, the prohibition of mixed marriages, forced sterilization, even the extermination of vanquished peoples are to find their first testing ground in the colonial world. Let us also remember to, again, tie this back to our discussion on biopolitics, scholar Alexander Wehelie, who in his brilliant, brilliant book, Habeas Fiscus, offers uh, an incredible analysis of biopolitics vis-a-vis vis -vis black feminist thought and racializing assemblages. Wahilia contends that, and this is a quote, racial slavery represents the biopolitical nomos, uh, let's remember that this is a Greek word meaning law or custom, of modernity, particularly given its historically antecedent status vis-a-vis -vis the Holocaust and the many different ways it highlights the continuous and non-exceptional modes of physiological and psychic violence exerted upon black subjects since the dawn of modernity. Now, taking all of this, all of these discussions, all of this context into account, it must be noted that whereas Marian's depiction of the peacock flower highlights the inhuman conditions that indigenous and African peoples endured, her account needs also to be approached with a certain degree of diffidence, let's say, um, or at least way more, um, way more distrust than, I guess, Schiebinger gives her in her book. Um, whilst, of course, her narrative, um, if, particularly if you read um, other accounts that uh, Schiebinger has in her book. But so while um, Marianne's narrative might come across as much more sympathetic than that of other voyagers, um, it must be also interrogated in relation to the colonial biopolitical system of the time. As other European naturalists of her time, Marian, uh, and this is a quote from Schiebinger, relied on Amerindians and African slaves, whom she referred to as my slaves, for aid in finding choice specimens and for safety in travel. So it was these people, according to Schiebinger, that hacked openings, this is again a quote, hacked openings for her in the dense rainforest, dug up roots, helped her tend her botanical garden, paddled her and her assistants upriver, and supplied choice maggots, fireflies, and shells. This reliance of European scientists on the knowledge and labor of those they themselves enslaved, of course, obscures once again, and this is a recurring conversation also in this class, the historical contributions of marginalized peoples to scientific endeavors. Casting again this sharp division amongst bodies, air quote, that were objects of knowledge, air quote, and those subjects, air quote, which were the producers of knowledge, again, air quote. 
Marion, a white woman, then penetrates the space of enslaved women as a foreign yet sympathetic actor, right? And yet her apparent sympathy cannot be divorced from her own role as someone who directly profited from the very system of bondage that she seemed, on the surface at least, to be so critical about. Although, of course, Marianne was remarkable in that she was, um, as I mentioned, one of the very few women to have undertaken such an expedition to the Americas, she only did so because of her whiteness. She was shielded by her whiteness. It is due to her position as a white woman that her story came to be sanctioned as scientific knowledge. Whereas her legacy and name lives on, including, for instance, she was the face of the 500 mark bill uh, before the euro here in Germany. Uh, so whereas her legacy lives on in so many ways, the enslaved people whom she interviewed remain anonymous, a collective of, uh, and here I think I'm, I'm using also this term very, very consciously, um, a collective of brown and black bodies. So it's a, a, a nameless mass from which only the so-called civilized Western subject is able to extract knowledge. She was the knower. They were the known. In spite... Now, um, having said that, in spite of its convoluted path throughout history, knowledge about the peacock flower's anti-fertility properties seems to have survived, um, of course it did, in, in um, communities in the global south. Recipes and methods of preparation have survived, have been transmitted across generations, and its use has not gone unnoticed. In the past few years, um, a few scientific studies that investigate the potential benefits of the plant have been published. Ido and Onibe uh, in 2007 list Cisalpinia pulcherima as emenagogue. Emenagogue is a substance that um, promotes menstruation. Um, so Ido and Onibe uh, list the plant as an emenagogue amongst a variety of other plants used in traditional medicine in Edo State, Nigeria. The Shmuk and Zad investigating the use of the plant in folk medicine in India, report that three different extracts of the plant administered orally to rats were found to have anti-fertility properties. A dosage of 400 milligrams per kilogram, per kilogram of body weight was shown to have 100% abortifacient activity. Similar, um, similarly, Raj and al., uh, in 2011, report that after histological analysis of the effects of the, um, an extract of the plant's leaves, they have found strong indicators of contraceptive effects. Mitra and Mukherjee in 2009 um, described a number of abortifacient methods used by indigenous peoples in West Bengal and offer a more accurate description of how the remedy is prepared and, and administered. Um, and this is their quote. Dried leaf infusion, about one cupful, is given in early morning in empty stomach to induce abortion by the Lohar tribe. It is said that single dose is highly effective abortifacients to induce abortion of up to two months pregnancy. If the first dose is failed, then a second dose is given after seven days. Um, Morton, in 1980, also reports a number, uh, on a number of folk medicines used in Latin America and the Caribbean, and also describes um, specifically the medicinal uses of this plant, offering um, an, an approximate recipe for extracts. Morton says, A decoction of a handful of flowers of Cisalpinia pulcherima, boiled in 
100 cc water acts as an amenagogue. A stronger dose causes abortion. A dose of 4 grams of leaves serves as an abortifacient. Powdered flowers are insecticidal. Nevertheless, in Barbados, an infusion of crushed flowers is given to children to soothe the stomach and relieve griping. Morton is not alone in reporting uses of this plant actually as a treatment also for gastrointestinal problems. For instance, botanists uh, Cecilia de Fátima de Almeida and Clarissa Gomes Reis Lopes investigating the ethnobotanics of medicinal plants in the Xingó, which is a region straddling the states of Pi in northeastern Brazil and in Piauí, respectively. Um, they so both uh, Geomeda and his Lopez list the plant as a herbal um, remedy for gastritis. Rajan and al. in 2011 describe um, similar uses in traditional Indian Ayurvedic medicine and report findings that indicate that the plant has indeed an inhibiting effect on, gast on gastric ulcers. Now, curiously, Julie Vera, um, in an extensive study of the ethnobotanics of the northern Brazilian state of Piauí, only mentions Cisalpinia pulcherima as an ornamental plant. Now, um, whereas the Flos pavonis continues to be used, of course, in context, um, where there is a limited or non-existent access to birth control technologies more familiar uh, within a Western or um, context, its use cannot only be attributed to um, a lack of access to other methods, nor to some misplaced causal uh, effectual correlation between a nation's economic development and the practices. Um, of birth control, and particularly um, pharma pharmacological um, um, uh, yeah, like pharmaceutical um, remedies of birth control. The use of, of uh, herbal medicines is actually a socially and culturally located phenomenon, right? Um, as much as it is, of course, an economic one. To, to many, these remedies elicit a lot more trust than these industrially manufactured pharmaceuticals. Herbal medicines are, in that sense, um, I would say material actualization of historical and cultural sightings. Their widespread consumption of foregrounds practices of care that have evolved otherwise um, often as a response to the duress of colonial biopolitics. These remedies, they tell stories. They tell stories of resistance, of research, of tradition, of kinship. That which is crucial in one articulation of, of practices of birth control might not be so in another. For some, cinnamon is nothing more than a spice. The flos pavonis is just a beautiful ornamental plant. For others, it can be these can be fundamental parts of a local pharmacopoeia. The use of the peacock flower as this anti-fertility agent, um, of course, predates the intervention of European science. This was a medication developed. <clears throat> sorry, for and by enslaved peoples, those surviving within the remarkable perversity of colonial biopolitics. These were peoples who were stripped of their subjectivities by white supremacy. Um, the, the ability to articulate networks of care within these spaces and um, was because of this uh, greatly restricted, of course. But yet, yet, the use of this plant could offer a welcome respite. Mm. Sorry, some water. Um, in these extreme conditions, 
uh, the use of this plant granted a remarkable degree of self-determination in a situation where black and indigenous and other people of color were traded as commodities, were treated as commodities. Remedies like the peacock flower, and of course there are many, many of those, this is not the only plant, um, are the result of collective and centuries-long efforts for the for the um, for the preservation, really, of cultural practices. They materialize, in many ways, stratified and historical bodies of knowledge. These practices and remedies emerge not as results of the collision between capitalism and modernism, nor as a push towards Western notions of modernization and development, but rather they are strategies of resistance. Discussing, uh, maybe to, to give you an example, um, discussing passport forgery as a form of critical practice, design researcher Mahmoud Keshavas points out um, in 2016 that these documents are, uh, and this is a quote, a form of material dissent and yet another material declaration of the fictitious and at the same time artifactual relation between the nation and the body. Similarly, the preparation and use of homemade abortive fashioned or contraceptive remedies by marginalized subjects may be regarded as a form of cultural practice, as in the sense that it materializes a rejection to subjugation, troubling the colonial hierarchies that create the subjugation in the first place. The possibilities that these remedies afford to the subjects that use them is crucial, I think, in understanding their ability to trouble colonial biopolitics. These remedies are more often than not um, recipes, right? Sets of instructions often passed down through generations as oral traditions. But they're not only sets of instructions. They establish different axes of performance in the sense that um, I would say maybe two axes of performance. One that describes how um, that describes a certain way of relating to uh, to the environment and to a non-human being uh, in order to uh, to have a, a desired outcome within a given body, which would be this would be uh, the manufacturing process of the remedy itself, which requires a remarkable degree of understanding also of these non-human beings. Because, of course, when you're dealing with plants, let's, I think uh, this is also important to remember, when we are dealing with plant remedies, we're not dealing with um, something that is um, quantifiable. We're not dealing with, like, take five pills which contain a, a given amount of active compound. You're dealing with um, with a living dynamic being. Uh, you you cannot um, you're not um, having numbers like that to refer to. So you need to know the environment. You need to know the plant that you're dealing with in order to know how much of it. Also, you you need to use. Um, so it is uh, a very, very complex subject that requires, it's not only, as I said, it's not only a recipe, it's a, a set of, of knowledges and a cultural practice that is passed down and that, um, that is, um, um, very, uh, yeah, I mean, would you uh, one one I guess maybe to to drive what I mean here? Um, it's useful to ask um, a question that I typically ask whenever I give a talk and talk about these things. Um, it happens quite often that people come to me and say, "Can you give me a recipe?" And what I reply to people is, "Would you ask for a recipe from?" Uh, for a recipe for like an, an, a birth control pill, you would not. 
And uh, I think this question particularly betrays, um, and I know that, you know, some of the papers that I, I quoted here uh, do uh, give you an idea of, um, of what people do and do try to quantify um, some of these remedies. But um, I think it's important to keep in mind um, that um, herbalists have a profound knowledge of the plants that they're working with and the environment that they're working with. Um, a chili pepper, for instance, would yet uh, will uh, produce a chili pepper plant will produce chilies that are far hotter if it gets more sun than if it gets less sun. So you need to understand all of these things in order to deal with these remedies. And I think um, this question asking, you know, for uh, for a recipe or reducing that to uh, to merely a recipe uh, in that sense, I think it betrays ultimately um, um, a lack of respect, honestly, uh, towards um, these practices or... Um, um, a lack of understanding that this is um, an actual uh, field of knowledge and a valid field of knowledge that is on par with um, with pharmaceutical knowledge, with um, with knowledge of medicine. Anyway, this was perhaps a, a little bit ranty, but I think it's um, it's quite important to to understand. Um, so I was talking about like these two axes um, within which um, we we can understand um, the 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 idea of the herbal remedy, right? Um, one of them um, pertains to the, as I said, to the manufacturing process of the remedy itself, and the second. I would say describes how the body itself should um, should um, perhaps engage with uh, this remedy, um, which means by, by which I mean how the remedy must be used. Um, the ingredients, of course, um, de vary depending on the source, right? Um, I mentioned that there are many many plants that people have uh, used. Um, throughout uh, history, in order to manage their fertilities, because this is something this is something that people have always needed. People have always needed to manage their fertilities. So, um, of course, the ingredients vary uh, depending on the context and the source. Um, cinnamon infusions, for instance, um, which is something that a lot of people um, use in Brazil. Um, some recommend um, um, the uh, use of the um, spice itself is that this should be enough to provoke very, very early abortions, while others recommend the addition of other plants uh, or spices to the, the cinnamon infusion. Um, and uh, in the case, um, for instance, um, yeah, this uh, uh, this uh, added uh, these added ingredients can be things like cloves or rue or mugwort. Um, and the instructions also for the intake, um, so for the way in which um, the body engages with this remedy. Um, also vary, right? Um, some recommend the use of several smaller doses over, over an extended period of time, while others claim that a single dose uh, should be enough. And the methods of preparation, I mean, they, they and this is, a, I think, my own observation, they um, remind me so much of a kind of ritual, you know, like chopping, boiling, straining, mixing, Boiling again, letting um, a mixture cool, and then drinking it. Do this one, two, three, four, five, ten times. And uh, 
The question is that regardless of the variety of approaches, however, it is in repeating this, um, these practices um, and uh, these um, orientations, these um, instructions, which are often also communicated through veiled words, uh, because often uh, this needs to be communicated in that way. Um, so it is in through this repetition that practices of care that are fundamental for the affirmation of humanity of marginalized communities and peoples emerge and resist. Through the, the repetition and reproduction, the recipe then, or this, um, not the recipe, let's say, the, the remedy becomes a critical artifact. The herbal remedy becomes a critical artifact capable of troubling colonial hierarchies that frame uh, black and indigenous and other people of color as inferior, incapable of managing our sexualities and fertilities. So the herbalist and the healer is, in this way, an actor of a radical form of care. And here, let's remember the association between the word radical and the root. Um, this is, I think, a beautiful and poetic reminder that dismantling the association between, um, between the word, uh, sorry, between um, the dismantling the, the perverse structure of white supremacy is a practice that requires us to dig deep into the foundations of our own understanding of the world. But it is also a, a beautiful and poetic reminder that this is also a practice of seeing each other's humanity and of being present with and for one another. Now, with this thought, I think for today we can stop here. Um, I could talk about this, honestly, for hours and hours, but this video is already quite long, so I'll stay here. Um, I hope that this little journey through the history of, um, of this plant has been interesting for you, as it's been interesting for me. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to continuing this conversation with you tomorrow in, uh, in our class. Um, we'll be there at the usual hour. Thank you so much for watching and looking forward. Bye.